Hello. The snows have fled away and the grass is coming back to the fields and the trees are getting back their hair. I thought it would be fun just to have subtitles in Latin for a change. Every YouTube, every book review should have its own claim to fame or USP, so that's mine, I think. <laughs> what I do have is a whole lot of books on poetry. I keep reading out poems to you um, because I feel that if I'm going to talk about a poetry book, there's not a plot to say it is this, this character, this happens. Um, there's not enough clue what's inside the book, so if I just hold up a book, what kind of poetry is in it? What kind of writing is it? Because in poetry, it's all to do with the words. Where do we meet poetry? I've got a book here called Poems on the Underground. So the poems cover um, hundreds of years of poetry. And basically it was a small little project started by a few people who genuinely love poetry and thought it could speak to people, even in those little tiny windows of time between one thing and another. So this, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Here's one that's just four lines by Adrian Mitchell. Celia, Celia, when I am sad and weary, when I think all hope has gone, when I walk along High Holborn, I think of you with nothing on. So, not always serious, a mixture of, of different kinds. And here's a poem, can you guess, this is a very famous writer who wrote it, it's called Piano. And I wonder if you can guess who it is. And I keep stroking my chin because this has got hairs and I keep catching. So, if you'll pardon my tartan beard, let's get on with the piano. <clears throat> Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cosy parlour, the tinkling piano our guide. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great black piano appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. D. H. Lawrence. A few things from the introduction. He is simply saying that this has gone on to be adapted by Trian train stations all over the place, Dublin, Stuttgart, Barcelona, Athens, Shanghai, Moscow, New York, Paris. So maybe wherever you are, you've also seen those posters with poems in your underground station. And finally, uh, in part of the introduction, very last sentence. There remains an apparently inexhaustible supply of delightful, funny, witty, astonishing and consoling poems that seem exactly right. It is a privilege to be able to share them with the travelling public. Poems on the Underground. I think a, a really good poem about the sea, if you read it, you don't go, mmm, nice. You feel like you've got spray in your face and it has brought back to you all the times that you encountered the sea. It just takes you there. So, on that basis, Anthony Wilson is talking about how he discovered poetry, what poems stirred him, and he also tells us about the time in his life when he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and through the treatment, how things were for him, how he came out the other side, so there's a, there's a positive spin, but of course he didn't know that at the time, and he's gone on to do more and more work in teaching others poetry and uh, writing his own. So for this, this is actually, I came across this first as a blog, and you can too, and it is such a generous one because each time he is 
talking about another poet in a wonderfully keen way. So I folded back a few pages just to show you. Here's one he's read. Uh, it's by Marin Sorescu, translated from the Romanian. With only one life. Hold with both hands the tray of every day and pass in turn along this counter. There is enough sun for everybody. There is enough sky and there is moon enough. The earth gives off the smell of luck, of happiness, of glory, which tickles your nostrils temptingly. So don't be miserly. Live after your own heart. The prices are derisory. For instance, with only one life, you can acquire the most beautiful woman plus a biscuit. And he wrote about that and where he came across it and how much everyone enjoyed that last line. An unusual book that you may not have seen on too many other book reviewings is this one, The Novel Cure. And it is what it says on the tin. It is claiming that it can help you with problems in life if you are recommending the right book. So you tell it, it the book, it, your symptoms, and it recommends what to read. So for example, we have got being too busy. Well, that's a pretty common ailment these days, isn't it? Here's what the book has to say. It recommends The 39 Steps by John Buchan, which funnily enough was in my previous shelf review. And I find it a very quick book. And this is basically saying something the same. So maybe I'm even right. Here's what it says. Being too busy. You've got a company to run. See dictator being a, so that's another section in the book. A bookshelf to assemble. See DIY. Dinner to cook for 20. See burning the dinner. And your best friend is in hospital. See hospital being in. So you're too busy to read this prescription let alone the novel we're prescribing, but just for a minute, enter the life of Richard Hannay and you might find an antidote. And it explains how fast the book is. So, let's see what else it has got to offer. They're arranged in alphabetical order of ailments. So, for example, the 10 best novels to cheer you up. Who wouldn't want to know what those are? It recommends When the Green Woods, woods Laugh, H.E. Bates, Auntie Mame, uh, Patrick Dennis, Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg, which is a fun film. I recommend that as a film. Cold Comfort Farm, Stella Gibbons. Totally agree. Thumbs up. I love it. All Creatures Great and Small, James Herriot. Fever Pitch by Nick Hornby. Man and Boy, Tony Parsons. Major Pettigrew's Last Stand by Helen Simonson. I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. And Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day by Winifred Watson. So all sorts of recommendations in here. If you feel that your to be read list is getting short or you need a whole bunch of new books, um, this might be a good start because it will recommend so many different things. It's got answers to your problems on obesity, which is to say, ha, huh, funnily enough, a far read a far cry from Kensington, Muriel Spark, which is one of the books on the shelf that I'll be reviewing, funnily enough. I hadn't realised that, that's good. Money not having any. Motherhood, problems with midlife crisis, irritability. Um, it recommends the Blackwater Lightship by Colm Tobin. Identity crisis. Um, being too honest. <laughs> In need of friends. Coping without family. DIY. Despair. Being a coward. Going cold turkey, come cold. It gives you the 10 best novels for when you've got a cold. Huh, I think I'll put this up on my screen and just let you have a look at those. So the novel cure, an A to Z of literary remedies. Black Rainbow, Rachel Kelly. This is a a wonderful book, a really honest look at somebody who went through two terrifying phases of being overwhelmed and mentally ill. And in the first one, <coughs> she required hospitalisation, but she found it so horrific that she didn't want to have it again for her second treatment. 
and she's very very honest she's a very successful doing everything kind of woman and it all grinds to a halt and she becomes this terrified woman in the fetal position in bed unable to cope and it's fantastic because she is a journalist she is a good writer she has gone through it and described it to you the pain the symptoms what helped what didn't help how she was and it was a very long and slow recovery and I lent this book to a friend of mine who had a daughter who went through some very sudden debilitating depressions and whenever my friend returned it to me she said this is so familiar she found it very true to what her daughter had experienced what they felt as a family um, going through it with her but one of the things in this book is that one of the few things that helped was that her mother would come and hold her hand in bed and say a few words and it seemed to make things a bit better and it started off with a, a, a line from the Bible which is about my grace is sufficient for you um, and she would repeat that and then they began to have the odd line or two of poetry with her mother both of them loved reading both of them shared that beforehand and so this book becomes not only her symptoms what she's doing what she's feeling but the words that were helpful to her the poetry that was helpful to her and when and I think it's tremendous for reading if you have somebody you know who's gone through sudden very serious depressive episodes um, to understand what they're thinking about. So Rachel Kelly, uh, the subtitle is How Words Healed Me, My Journey Through Depression, a book worth having. Now an anthology based on a series of articles in a newspaper, Ruth Fidel, 52 Ways of Looking at a Poem, a poem for every week of the year. It does pretty much what you would expect each week, a different poem, a different poet, but she shows exactly what each word and sound is doing in the poems. And you begin to realise that poetry is small writing because every little syllable is doing something. And she shows you how it all fits together and becomes like a little machine working or that it's a bit like a mosaic where you have lots of little tiny coloured pieces making up an interesting pattern. But if one of those tiny small or pieces was somewhere else in the wrong place it would just would not work so this will really help you to understand how poems work what makes them great and because it's 52 different poems you've got 52 poets that you suddenly discover i don't think we're making very fast progress here i think i better hurry up or we'll be here all day okay exercises and style by raymond is where he takes a little description and then he rewrites the same little couple of paragraphs in a whole range of literary styles so he's got metaphorical he's got like a dream he rewrites it like a rainbow a word game um, precision subjective narrative um, like speaking personally, like exclamations, like comedy, like a cross-examination. Um, it's just fantastic. It's, if you write at all, um, it's worth looking at to see how one very simple episode, one simple occurrence of a few people getting on a bus can be written in so very many different ways. And a bus has just gone by outside as if on cue. Next one almost nobody is going to have learning to love Prost poetry collection curated by Chris Gowan and in this I have skin in the game so to speak it's an anthology I have two poems in it and it's an opportunity that Chris gave to us to submit poetry for people who aren't widely published or have solo collections themselves really in most cases so he broke it up into different types of themes 
Fear, doubt, becoming, losing. The world is beautiful, the world is broken. Inside, outside, wilderness, laughing out loud. The far horizon, learning to love. Okay. Now, for those of you who are fed up with poetry, don't like it, here's something completely different that should not be on that shelf. The AA Guide to Scotland. And next, to join it, Scottish Islands, Highlands and Islands, Rough Guide. The one thing we can say is that the next book is a book of poems called Map, so there's a tiny little connection. But even just the names and Scottish Highlands and Islands, let me see. Noidart, Invermoriston, Speyside, Strathspey, Glen Esk, Glen Isle, Aberfeldy, wonderful, brilliant bookshop there with a fantastic coffee shop underneath the um, Aberfeldy Mill. Do not miss if you're in the area. Let's see, any other places? Arran, of course, Campbelltown, Isle of Call, Open, and so forth. But some of the names are quite poetic. Still shouldn't be on that shelf, let's be honest. Still should not be there. And here's a tenuous link to the poetry of um, Vizlawa Simborska, which I'm probably not saying right, and Map, Collected and Last Poems. So the wonderful picture of her on the back cover shows you how fun she is, how mischievous, thoughtful and the poems have been gathered together by um, a long-term collaborator who translated her, Claire Kavana. So Vizlawa, the Borska, her dates are 1923 to 2012, born in Poland. Worked as a poetry editor, translator and columnist. She was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1996. And she reads in translation as somebody who is speaking to you. Um, she's got a sense of fun and if I looked at an interview with Claire Kavna and she said about Zaborska that she had a tremendous sense of fun and she would often go to visit her and take with her a little kind of working toy and uh, she said at one point she took one to Zaborska and she gave the same one to her little son who was quite you know, young at the time, sort of primary school and she said the difference was that her son grew out of the toy but Zaborska did not. She still enjoyed it. So one of her poems, this I'm going to read you a tremendously short one for those of you who are really getting a bit poetry poetry out. And then I'll read you a slightly longer one um, for those of you who, uh, who would like more. The Three Oddest Words. When I pronounce the word future, the first syllable already belongs to the past. When I pronounce the word silence, I destroy it. When I pronounce the word nothing, I make something no non-being can hold. So that's only six lines, but it's, she's saying something in the middle of it that makes you go, what? What? Um, I must, must read you a poem called Sam, which was also recommended um, in the book Life Saving Poems I was talking about earlier, which I think is so appropriate for our times because it happens to be about boundaries. Although it's called Sam, again, a very short poem, only just over 20 lines. Sam. Oh, the leaky boundaries of man-made states. How many clouds float past them with impunity. How much desert sand shifts from one land to another. How many mountain pebbles tumble onto foreign soil in provocative hops. Need I mention every single bird that flies in the face of frontiers or alights on the roadblock at the border. A humble robin. Still, 
Its tail resides abroad while its beak stays home. If that weren't enough, it won't stop bobbing. Among innumerable insects are single out, only the ant, between the border guards' left and right boots, blithely ignoring the questions where from and where to. Oh, to register in detail, at a glance, the chaos prevailing on every continent. Isn't that a privet on the far bank, smuggling its hundred thousandth leaf across the river? And who but the octopus, with impudent long arms, would disrupt the sacred bounds of territorial waters? And how can we talk of order over all, when the very placement of the stars leaves us doubting just what Shang foresee? Wislawa Simborska. Okay, this next book was a gift. I didn't choose it myself. Uh, Life Support by Julia Copus, a collection of poems to read uh, for comfort. It was given to me at the start of lockdown. It has a poem in it I love, which I will read briefly. It's Louis McNeese, so a fellow countryman of mine, and it's only about 12 lines. Snow. The room was suddenly rich and the great bay window was spawning snow and pink roses against it, soundlessly collateral and incompatible. World is suddener than we fancy it. World is crazier and more of it than we think, incorrigibly plural. I peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various. And the fire flames with a bubbling sound, for a world is more spiteful and gay than one supposes. On the tongue, on the eyes, on the ears, in the palms of one's hand, there is more than glass between the snow and the huge roses. Louis Mcneese. So, there we go.